go ahead and start the recording and start the chapter business. Um, so, Jim, would you like to go ahead and officially open the meeting for us tonight? And, Jim, you'll have to take yourself off of mute to do that. All right. Maybe. Uh, let's see. Did we we didn't lose Jim, did we? All right. Well, I I don't know. Jim, is your audio working? Oh right. no. Okay. okay. Now we hear you. So would you like to go ahead and kick off the meeting, and I'll go okay. ahead and 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 make all the announcements. Okay. I'd like to uh, open the meeting again. Thank Rochelle for doing a great job of uh, setting these programs up in Zoom and get a great array of speakers from all over the world for us when we're not able to get out so much. Uh, one of the things we had tonight, it's uh, time for our uh, annual election of officers again. Our nominee committee again was chaired by Ann Hicks and she has a little report to give. All right, thanks Jim. So welcome everyone. We have a couple things to go through. Let me just show you the agenda. Um, and for those of you who didn't get a chance to meet Jim during the birder chat, Jim is the president of our chapter. And so thank you for officially opening it and welcoming everyone um, to our members, our guests, and also uh, our special guests joining us who are fans of Gunners um, and who have had a chance to bird with him. So hopefully when we get to the Q&A portion, you can share some of your wonderful Gunner experience adventure stories. Um, so we have, as Jim mentioned, a couple of chapters after business items, we're going to officially discuss the elections process. Um, Bert Alm is not with us tonight, our field trip director, but I'm going to be serving in his behalf. And I'll provide you with a couple of updates on some upcoming field trips. I will then highlight the next two um, upcoming meetings. And then at that point, I'll bring our wonderful speaker to the stage. Um, so first, as Jim mentioned, um, it is the first stage of our elections in which we um, chose a nominating committee, which part of that is to um, have a non-elected officer serve in that role along with at least one representative from the chapter. So we, we have chosen Ann Hicks and Nancy Herko has been gracious to join as well. Um, and would you like to officially read our slate of officers, officer candidates? I apologize, Rochelle, my screen, my screen. All right, and it sounds like you're having some screen issues. I think so. So um, since we announced Anne, you know, you know all of us to pretend that I am Anne saying this, so she's sort of saying it through the chat. <laughs> um, but with my Anne hat on, I am happy to announce the nominating committee, or sorry, the nominating committee uh, led by Anne is happy to announce the following individuals for the slate of officers for the 2021-2022 election process. Um, Jim Stahl is running for president. I am graciously running again for vice president. Jeff Lamoff as treasurer and Deborah Longman Marion for secretary. Um, this is also the opportunity that if any of you have an interest in nominating somebody or if any of you would like to nominate yourself, if you'd like to put that information in the chat window um, or when we get to Q&A, you can do that as well. But I would just like to thank our nominating committee, Ann Hicks and Nancy Herko for leading our election process. And Ann, let me just check with you one more time. Did, were you able to come back and say anything? I'm back now. But okay. I've lost it like four times and I don't know why. Okay, thank you. So thank you for covering for me. <laughs> so you could just say everything Rochelle said and we're good. <laughs> All That's right. So how everything Rochelle says. <laughs> All right. So let's do a little round of applause on Zoom for our, our candidates. And then we'll see you all next month yeah. as we progress the election process. All right, thanks so much, Ann. Okay, so some updates of the last time we met. Um, and for those of you who were with us at the last meeting or perhaps watched the recording, uh, we had a wonderful speaker from UCF uh, talk about uh, the Purple Martin Project. Um, and it has officially launched and there we've got a wonderful name called Purple Patrol. Um, in that meeting, we were a couple weeks away from launching this and she let us know that there was gonna be a community science opportunity, which you can do as an individual or you can do as a social pod, 
or you can choose to do on your own in a small group. Um, on any of those will we'll work, and basically um, it's going to be conducted um, at the Orlando Wetlands Park. And the way that you sign up is through this URL, um, and, and there's also a flyer, and I've put that on Meetup, and I'll ask Susan when she gets back. She's had a death in the family, unfortunately. When she gets back in town, I'll ask her if she can put that flyer up on um, the website. Uh, but basically, what they're trying to do is to see what type of activity is going on with Purple, Nar Purple Martins in terms of are any being observed and actually using natural nesting cavities? That's the, uh, that's the goal of this citizen science, community science project. Um, so we hope that many of you will get involved. I know that um, our group was just there, I think that was last weekend, um, and Bert sent some information in and sent some, some of what they saw then over to, to, the, to Anna, Dr. Dr. Forsman. And also our dear Fritz, as many of you know him, uh, sent me a picture of the Sun Tree Golf Course where they have a Purple Martin condo, um, the Gord condo. And they, he was able to get some really good shots of some of the Purple Martins coming in and out. So here's that information because this is hot off the press. She announced it here last month, but now it's officially open as a project and we hope many of you will participate. Okay, so now I've got Bert's hat on. I should have I should have worn costumes tonight because I'm getting to be several people. But um, so as Bert, as the field trip director, I just wanted to give you some updates related to upcoming activities. Um, as uh, some of you know, and for those of you who are newer to the group, and I think we have at least two first-time attendees who are part of the group, uh, we have been slowly trying to figure out the right process to be able to still limit. Um, trips groups to 10 people with one leader but find the right places that we could go that we could stagger the groups and um, take different trails and things like that to be able to grow the participation so um, that has occurred for jetty park so that is march 28th um, it's limited to 30 participants and three leaders so what that basically means is they'll take one group of 10 and one will go into one area of the jetty, then they'll take another area of the jetty, and basically so, so the groups never pass each other. Um, for anyone who, if it's your first time to go into Jetty Park, there is a fee that the park charges, and there's a special discount or an annual pass that you can buy, which basically if you go twice, it's worth the annual pass if you are a Brevard County resident. So just be mindful, as, uh, for those who are used to our field trips, we don't charge for anything, but that fee is gonna be assessed directly by the park. And at this time, and things you know change day by day as it goes with um, COVID, right now you have to pay that online. So, so all of those details are in the meetup announcement, but if, if you're interested in that, please go take a look at that. Um, April 10th, very excited about this. Um, the Cocoa Conservation Area, um, it's a lot of folks haven't been there. It's a bit newer to many of us, and we are so fortunate to be able to um, have an official field trip there. Um, because of the size and size of the parking and those kind of things, this is going to be limited to two leaders, so two separate groups going in two different directions, 10 participants each. Um, and so this will be our first time as, as a chapter going to that location and being able to document some sightings in eBird, so as a whole group. So, um, and that was brought to us by one of our members is, uh, who's been actively watching that area. So we're super excited to have a new um, place to offer everyone to the group. Then um, April 25th, the Indian River Lagoon River Preserve State Park. Um, this is also limited to 20 people, two participants, sorry, 20 participants, two leaders. Um, Bert has been scouting a potential option to do a third group and maybe stagger the time on this one. Um, we probably will definitely look to do that if we've got a good migration group coming through or just a little near this area. It, you know, a lot of folks will want to carry on and head down to the inlet. But right now, until he gets a third leader or we figure out a different route, we're still looking at 20 participants, two leaders. And then the last thing I wanted to mention before we talk about other ways to get involved, Global Big Day. Um, you know, we started really beefing this up the last couple of years. And then, of course, COVID took a detour last year. But we did something super fun last year. We're going to do the same thing this year where you're going to bird on your own, but we're going to sort of have like the check-in during the day. So we did some um, fill, or sorry, texting groups and some WhatsApp groups. And we had a little bit of, I'll call it bird banter, if you want to call it that, um, online during, on the meetup group where the chat part is where you can add your 
or comments. That's what we did last year. So sort of a, it's 10 o'clock, checking in. What are you seeing? Where are you? Where's your group? Um, so we'd love it if you would either bird on your own, call a couple of your social pod buddies. Perhaps if you have a family pod, um, call them and bird in different locations. And then it, it would be wonderful if you would participate by checking in throughout the day. Um, the, the global birding, is, um, International Global Birding Association is doing a, a special event with BirdLife International um, so that any um, anyone who signs up um, online and, and actually uploads or documents an eBird list that day, it will all count towards this global goal that they have for the big day. And if they reach certain numbers, some of the sponsors are going to make extra donations to BirdLife International in order to help with the um, prevent, trying to prevent the illegal trade and sale and capture of birds, which of course some of you know that there's some scientific backing to just part of that illegal bird trade and illegal animal trade relate to this whole virus and certainly if not this virus, many others. So helping be a part of contributing to community science data on Global Big Day could actually help um, to a wider goal with some of the international sponsors who are going to be part of this um, and make this donation to BirdLife International. So that's that. Um, BERT does not yet have Global Big Day information up on the website because we're going to think about maybe special check-in times and that kind of stuff. Um, it's great if you do sign up, even though we aren't coming together as a group, just so that we have a way of communicating with all of you and also share whatever methods we're going to be using if you want to be in a text group or one of these kind of special things. Um, then other ways to get involved, you know, we're about birds and so much more. So uh, we are um, 100 acre hollows. And, and for those of you who are from out of our area, that is a reclaimed, abandoned water treatment facility that has now been turned into green space by a, an NGO nonprofit group um, called 100 acre hollows. And we're, we're going to have the first ever bio blitz there. So it's 114 acres. Um, so easy social distancing on this one. Um, so that's March 27th. And the goal for the group, um, and also I'm sorry for the people from out of town, I meant to mention that how our part of our deep connection to this is besides people serving on the board and volunteering out there is we have our Audubon in Action Grant Garden, Native Plant and Pollinator Garden is house, housed and hosted on the property there. So we have a wonderful um, bee box and butterfly box and native plant garden and kiosk and educational signage and interpretive information all at that garden. And so that's all gonna be part of that day. And the goal is to document 500 observations in the iNaturalist project. So if you're not familiar with iNaturalist, we will have handouts and information on how to sign up for it. But basically an observation, very much like eBird, um, uh, is something that you see and, and capture in the app. But the what difference with iNaturalist is it's plants, it's birds, it's insects, frogs, um, you know, um, go for tortoises, because there's a whole hundreds of those out there. So I think it, we, it's achievable to think that we could get 500 observations of everything, wildlife, including plants and fa flora and fauna. Um, so please come out and join us for that. And that that is up on Meetup now. So if you'd like to sign up, all the details of the times and all those kind of things are located there. And for everyone who's been participating in Feeder Watch, thank you. Um, if you didn't see this information, just to let you know, they wanted to provide a little bit more opportunity for collecting a bit more data. So they've just announced they're gonna go ahead and extend that to April 30th. So please continue to share your observations there until April 30th. And then lastly, um, we were meant to have a frog activity this year. For those of you who've been around for a while, uh, I try to always have, since I've come onto the board, um, it's been one of my things to do a nocturnal um, citizen science or community science activity. So we did a moth event, we did a bat event, we did an owl event, and this was meant to be um, our, our frog event. But given our situation, we can't come together the way we normally do. We are going to still have the Frog Watch team come out to 100 Acre Hollows, and you could you could join because it's 114 acres and walk around and do some recordings sort of on your own, but we can't come together as a big group for that. But you could come out, learn from the zoo team how to do um, frog observations and listen for them and do some recordings. And that's going to be on April 18th also at 100 Acre Hollows. 
So that was a lot. <laughs> I only have a little bit more and then you're here for the good stuff. Um, up Carmel general meetings, as Jim mentioned, we're going to continue on our tour around the world where we're going to go to um, Panama next month. So please join us here on Zoom in order for us to take wind and go off to Panama. And then in May, um, many of our folks in our group are active or have been active members of Eagle Watch monitoring balding nesting um, in, in Florida. And we are going to have um, the leader of Eagle Watch come and talk to us about the program, about the data, what's been going on. And fingers crossed, we might have a special guest that has a white head and some wings. I'll, I'll leave it to you to guess, but if it's, if it's going well, the Audubon Center for the Birds of Prey might come on the, the end with a special guest, if in fact it's a good day for that, that special guest. Um, so those are all those announcements. Now let's get to the good stuff. Look at this beauty here. Um, so I would like to welcome Gunnar. Um, and Gunnar is, um, you, you see all of the information here. I don't like to read these things, but he's got quite an interesting background. So he's Swedish. He lives in Peru. He travels the world. He's a runner. He's just got this cool, interesting background as it comes to music. Um, and he, I have to say, is just a really interesting, fascinating person. He's well read and has all kinds of interesting types of hobbies and, and things. And I, he has a positive outcome of COVID as it relates to a special um, condor project that we're going to hear about today. So Berter, uh, sorry, Gunnar, I'm going to stop um, sharing. If you'd like to go ahead and share your screen and let me welcome you to the digital stage and welcome to our group this evening. Oh, Gunnar, you're on, you're on mute. There we go. All right. There you go. All right. So, so if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen, then uh, we'll be good to go. Oh, wow. Looking at Stop, he said. Uh, let's see. I'm hearing coronavirus update. Is anyone not mu good. unmuted? There we go. Are you good, Gunnar, or do you need me to drive? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I want to put this on start here. All right. Okay. How does that work? Does that work all right? Not yet. So remember to select the screen that the the PowerPoint is in and then hit that oh, lower okay. right hand button. Yeah, that, that, it's that a, the yeah, yeah, the lower right hand button is always the issue. Um, <laughs> it trips up everybody. And right. then I'll let you know. Lower, um, no. So, so when you hit share screen, I did that. then select the which host of the little boxes. Uh, here, here it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Hold on. Let me re-enable you. I think when you, you held there for a second. All right. So you should be re-enabled now. All right. There we go. You have God powers again. Hey. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. We see it. And if you just like to put it in presentation view, we'll see this, the whole. What did I do now? Then? Oh, um, there. Oh, that's the one. All right. There we go. There we go. All right. Gunnar, over to you. Welcome to the Space Coast Audubon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it feels almost like a second home now because I've been going to uh, Space Coast every year now for the for this is the last four years, except last year, I guess, uh, this year, I guess. So I'm kind of missing that, but I'm glad to be joining up again. I, I did do a uh, small little presentation though for the virtual uh, Space Coast Birding Festival. And I guess quite a few of you guys have seen that so I am not going to talk about the same stuff today. Um, it will be a little bit of overlap. Uh, the first slide, I think, is an overlap as well. So we'll do that. But um, otherwise, I want to um, uh, talk like uh, Rochelle was saying, that some of my projects that are very close to my heart, and especially one about condors, but quite a few other things. I'm also starting a pelagic uh, whale watching uh, project near Nazca. And when it comes to the uh, birding today, I thought I'd be, uh, I realized I presented these short programs I have for Peru in that talk that I did for Space Coast Birding Festival. So I'm going to do the slightly longer one, which is a nice little cross section here today for uh, uh, the both birds and culture. It's the classic Southern Circuit that most sort of uh, non-birding tourists will be doing when they come to Peru. So um, we have the same route, but we're also looking at the birds at the same time. So you see all the classical things about Peru. 
Another project that I've been running for uh, several years now is uh, one at City Peru that's in central Peru. And uh, then finally, I will present some special offers I've thought out of, you know, how to reactivate the business after COVID. And uh, Peru has just opened its borders again, so you can actually travel to Peru uh, without having to do quarantine, uh, just having to have the PCR test and so forth. Uh, so I will be also including some last minute offers if you want to come like next week or something, all right? And finally, there's uh, uh, just a little uh, note about signing up for our newsletters if you haven't done that already. So, all right, so this is uh, Peru. Uh, it's a fairly large country. It's about the three times the size of uh, California. We got about uh, 30 million inhabitants and around 1,870 species. We got quite a few added last year as they split the Rufus and Pitta in I think we got like seven or eight species. Rufus and chestnut and pita were split, and we got like eight, seven or eight new species to Peru just because of those splits. Plus, we got a couple of new tapaculos described also last year. So um, uh, the number is sort of fluctuating a little bit. Uh, we uh, traditionally uh, sort of separate the country into three parts. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope you can. Uh, but it's uh, usually the coast. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. So that you have the coast with the Pacific Ocean, of course. Then you have the Andean chain from north, uh, well, north uh, west to the southeast, and uh, east of that is the lowlands, the lowlands of the Amazon. That's the Amazon. That's a big Amazon basin. And where do people live? Well, they mostly live, of course, in the uh, uh, on the coastal. Uh, in the dry, in, in the valleys that are coming down at different points uh, towards the coast. And Lima is the capital, of course. We have about 10 million people here. So it's about uh, a third of the country that lives here in Lima. And then there are a few towns also up in the Andes, but there, there are uh, much smaller. Cusco, I think, is the largest of them. And Arequipa uh, is sort of in between the Andes and the, and the lowlands in sort of a nice habit, a nice climate to around 2000 meters. So, but traditionally uh, the kids, uh, they will learn in school about Costa Sierra and Selva. So it's the coast, the mountains and the rainforest. But for birding purposes, it's quite a good idea to actually split it up in the north and the central and the south section. And uh, you cannot do just everything in just one go. You have to, uh, <laughs> you have to allow for a lot of time or you have to uh, pick the raisins and do do those and then you sort of come back and do the rest some other time but there's a lot to see in peru so if you want to clean up you probably need like uh, i put uh, 10 different five day tours back to back and then so it turned out to be 50 days and uh, that is not even cleaning up everything so uh, i'm hearing a train <laughs> in the background so i think you got a train outside of you rochelle there all right so uh, um, anyway, so 50 days or something uh, to uh, actually do the whole country and nobody has that time uh, realistically. So I will concentrate on the Southern Circuit today. And uh, so this is the Southern Burden Circuit. It starts, of course, in Lima. We'll be back to that and then comes down to Nazca, where the Nazca lines are. And then you travel along the coast up to Arequipa. You do a little uh, detour to Colca Canyon and then back again, crossing over here to the Titicaca Lake. And then you can go overland. Some people like to do this by train, but it's much faster with the car. And you get to Cusco. And then from Cusco, you do an excursion to Machu Picchu. And some people do an excursion to Manu. Or other people, they fly down to Puerto Maldonado, uh, which we do on this uh, uh, itinerary. Uh, for uh, Which is, uh, the itinerary, I think, is 16 full days. So the one I'm pre presenting. So first, we start in Lima. And this is a, it's a nice tour because we combine culture, we combine the birds, we combine food and uh, a lot of uh, history, of course. So we're trying to cover everything. And the other very novel thing about this tour is that it's actually possible to decide uh, how much money you want to spend. And uh, as I mentioned in my other talk, the, the main thing that costs money in the, um, when it comes to um, 
setting up a tour is the transport and the guide. So if you have a very small tour, of course, it's going to be quite expensive. And then there are different price lodge, lodging that you can do. Now, if you were to choose that yourself, or maybe you want to skip some dinners that you want, you know, you want to do that on your own, or maybe you just had too, too abundant a lunch. Well, in that case, it makes sense to have some options. So we have a flexibility on these programs that you can do for just the basics, which means that you get the guiding and the, and the uh, transport, and you get the breakfasts and lunches in the field. And then there are some excursions that are additional that you can take if you want to, or you can just you know, hang around in town. And you can do the bookings of the hotels yourself. It's quite easy to maybe get an Airbnb uh, where you stay with your partner and you spend far less than actually having a, a five-star hotel, and, but, but just as, as an amazing experience, for instance. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility. And then we have the, sort of the standard, and then we have like a top range as well. It's same like when you do and order something on the internet, you always have three different choices. And it's uh, to me kind of uh, interesting why people haven't done the same with birding tours. You know, why, why don't you have like three different quality options? And um, so we have tiered pricing introduced. So when you come to Lima, the first thing we will do after uh, having breakfast and, and maybe a little bit of uh, birding in the garden is that we go to archeological museum. And here we have some of the riches you know, the Inca Empire is just the top of the iceberg. We have a lot of cultures before the Inca Empire. Uh, the Inca Empire was in the, uh, well, it finished in the 16th century when the Spaniards arrived, but they were only active for about 100 years or so. And before that, there was many, many advanced cultures. And what you see on this uh, picture here, the oldest stuff here is probably this uh, <laughs> ceramics, erotic ceramics from the Mochi culture in the north. And that's about 400 AD. And then you have these uh, in, in, inquisitive ear plugs uh, from the Sipan culture around 1000 AD and the mask, the funerary mask is about the same time. And I believe the this tumi here, this cer ceremonial knife is around uh, 1200 AD in the Chima culture, but it could also be Lambayeki, I'm not quite sure. Uh, so anyway, we're gonna check out the archeological museum and then we'll start the birding by, um, so why is that? Okay. Uh, by going down to the wetlands near close to Lima called Pantanos de Villa. And uh, here, uh, this is right on the coast. We can see things like the Great Grebe, also the beautiful many colored rush tyrant is there. And uh, in the grassland behind the lagoons, we often find uh, larger groups of uh, Peruvian thickening. And uh, we continue south going along the uh, coast down south uh, to get to Paracas. So uh, before um, or until now, before I start my pelagic project, we are doing a boat trip in uh, Paracas to see uh, some sea lions and some uh, marine bird life as well. And uh, once we get our boat in further south, we will uh, skipping this and, and just go out to the desert. And uh, from the de uh, a viewpoint, we can actually see two species of sea lions both the South American sea lion and the South American fur seal. Fur seal is the one on the left. Uh, it has a pointy nose and it's much darker fur. And it's also, the males are much smaller than the sea lion males. Sometimes you also see um, a marine otter here, which is like a Southern uh, version of the sea otter that you find in California, for instance. Uh, you can also find the uh, Humboldt penguin and that should be easy, uh, easy to see also further south. And uh, you probably will try once you're starting going south and you're along the coast, some of the fantastic Peruvian cuisine that I mentioned. Here is the national dish. It's called the ceviche. It's lime marinated uh, white fish usually. And uh, you, uh, they mix this with coriander, the little green bits here, uh, red onion, and then they have uh, the lime with the uh, uh, red peppers. You can see some red uh, points here. These are chili peppers, very, very hot, called rocotto. And there's also some, um, uh, some milder pepper that gives it a nice flavor. You serve it with sweet potatoes and the roasted corn that does not pop. It's a special type of corn, delicious. And um, 
So uh, the Paracas is also famous for its archaeology. Now, you don't see much of that archaeology when you're in Paracas. You actually go south, further south the next day to Ica, and there's a nice museum there. And you can see some of these tapestries. They are over, um, they're almost 2,000 years old, and they've uh, fantastically broidered uh, very, very, uh, very, very fine uh, threads and uh, broider on top of this uh, uh, material. It's usually cotton or uh, some type of al alpaca or vicuña fibers that they uh, use in these uh, fantastic uh, tapestries that were used as um, Fernery bundles. They they buried the they mummified the dead and they made them bundles and they put them down under uh, in like cavities under the earth. And uh, so uh, the, these are the way the mummies look like uh, today at the uh, museum there at uh, Ica uh, further south. And uh, it's a very interesting museum that we also visit on the way. You can also see these sort of uh, the skulls there. You have the one on the left where they have. Uh, this form, the skulls, which was supposedly some sort of a, a beauty <laughs> um, uh, char characteristic of people of uh, the ar aristocratic or so forth. And so they pressed the, uh, the, the heads when the, the kids were really small and they got these elongated heads. And they also practiced uh, medicine of trepanation uh, and probably quite painful uh, operation. And you can see the skull on the right here that it was a successful one because uh, the, they had opened up this big hole and it actually grew back together again. The Nazca people, uh, of course, are famous also for their pottery. And here we see actually an Amazilia hummingbird depicted on, on the polychromatic pottery of the Nazca. Nazca is our nest destination. And um, before that, we will be visiting some uh, <laughs> Pisco uh, factories. Pisco is our uh, uh, national drink in Peru. It's a distillate of uh, the pure wine, actually. We, we, we are so poor of making wine. So uh, instead of trying to make a, a, a poor wine, we just uh, make pure alcohol out of the fermented grapes. And uh, then that is stored in these uh, vessels. And these vessels, uh, ceramic vessels, were actually called pisco. And that is like an old uh, pre, pre colonial type of storing uh, different types of liquids. And uh, they just kept on doing that in pisco. And that has given the name also to, uh, to the town of pisco and also to the drink. But most of the pisco is actually produced in the town of Ica, which is also the capital of the Ica department which uh, Paracas and Nazca also belongs to. Uh, so you can either drink it pure, of course. Uh, the connoisseurs like it pure. There are some types that are very aromatic, depending on what type of grape you use. Or you just use the traditional um, and very popular uh, drink called the Pisco Sour. And it's uh, lime. Uh, it's three parts Pisco, I think, which is 40%. And there's one part lime and one pint, uh, part uh, ice. And then uh, you uh, put a little bit of egg white and you put it in the mixer. And then you put, um, this is sacrilege actually, this one, they put cinnamon on top there. They should be, um, it should be um, Angostura bitter on top. And here you have the uh, machines, the, the, um, the destillate, destillation machines that they uh, use to the heat up those underneath. It's a very interesting procedure. And this we will do before actually flying over the Nazca lines. You don't have to if you want to, that's like an additional, but it's the only way to see the big lines in the desert. And uh, this uh, hummingbird is about a hundred meters, a hundred yards long. And uh, you have to fly over it to enable to see it. So south of Nazca is where I'm uh, putting together this uh, new project. And when we come down to the coast, we should be able to see the Inca turn and the uh, red leg cormorant. And um, they're both um, extremely pretty birds with uh, these coral red bills and the red feet. And uh, here's a red leg cormorant flying. And we also have here the blackish oyster catcher, which is uh, similar to the black oyster catcher of the Pacific 
uh, coast in the US, but uh, um, this one has uh, white legs. I think yours has red legs, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but if we are able to do these pelagics, uh, we will be rewarded with uh, very, very good birds here. We have uh, a waved albatross, Peruvian diving petrel, the ring storm petrel, and Markham storm petrel. And we're going to stay in a little village called P uh, Punta Lomas. And uh, so um, here's the thing about pelagics. We pioneered doing those in Lima in 1999, in December. And then by 2018, the port authorities sort of found out that we've been doing that for many years. <laughs> uh, not really. It wasn't our boat. We rented boats, of course, but these boats were not having the international standards for being out 35 nautical miles. Let me show you this picture here. Here is uh, just uh, Google uh, Maps showing uh, the Pacific Ocean and the, uh, and the Pacific Coast approved. So you have Lima up here in the north. And down here in the south is the point of Punta Lomas. Now, if you look, the shelf sort of starts here. You see this flat area here. This is no good for pelagic birds. So all this stretch here, that's about 35 nautical miles coming from uh, Callao to over here. That's too far away. Nautical miles, that's more than a normal mile. So it's uh, 1.9 kilometers a nautical mile, while a normal mile is 1.6 kilometers. So uh, it's about uh, yeah, 300 yards longer uh, per mile here. So 35 nautical miles here. And if you go down to the south here, you see the shelf is almost at uh, right on the coast. So uh, um, my idea then is to move the birders <laughs> and move them down here. It's a 500 kilometer stretch to come down here. But hey, if you're going to see the Nazca lines at the same time, and there's a lot of people doing the Nazca lines, well, why not come and see some of the marine life here, uh, down here, rather than in Paracas further north. You will see the same marine life here. And even better, you will see, have a much bigger chance of seeing whales from here. We uh, um, hypothesize that the whales will be here between November to March. At least they are on passage and the passage should be easy to see, but we, think that they also overwinter here. I've been seeing them in December, January, uh, February, and March. So uh, uh, humpback whales should be here all summer. And a lot of people are coming to uh, Nazca, of course. So it will be uh, quite easy to get them into uh, whale watching. It will be uh, much less cost also, of course, to operate from there. So I'm doing a fundraiser. And I will tell you a little bit about the fundraiser at the very end here now when we come back. To that. So we continue south and we will reach uh, Arequipa, which has this beautiful uh, volcano in the backdrop. It's called Misty. Uh, Arequipa is known as the White City. Uh, it's all built in white stiar, which is type of uh, lava stone. And uh, this is from the uh, very famous Santa Catalina um, monastery that we also visit uh, during this sort of combined culture and birding trip. Um, but inside here, there are lots of flowers. So you can actually see a Peruvian shear tail inside here. But it's an interesting visit. This was a totally closed um, uh, monastery for, for a long time. And it just opened up in, I think it was like 50s or 60s or so uh, to the public. So you can actually visit. Um, and now it's a very po popular tourist attraction. Uh, Arequipa is also famous for uh, its uh, food and its restaurants. You don't have to eat the guinea pig when you get there. But we will go to a gourmet restaurant run by the Peruvian chef uh, Gaston Acurio while we're there and have some uh, delicious uh, um, Arequipa food. You may try the uh, guinea pig if you <laughs> are so inclined. It doesn't have a lot of food on it. Um, uh, and the people that try it say it tastes like chicken. There you go. But it's a ceremonial dish that is often served at big uh, fiestas like weddings and um, or, or for Christmas in, uh, in, uh, in the Highlands. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think I prefer the ceviche. Anyway, we, the trip continues to Colca Canyon and Colca Canyon is very famous for the condors. Uh, you can see a lot of condors at the same time. Now in the, this time of year though, uh, the valley is often uh, uh, covered in fog. So it's very hard to see the condors and 
And therefore, we are starting this project also in Lima. And this photo here of the condor is actually taken in Lima. So um, one can see the condors there in Lima as well. Maybe I rewrite the program in the future. I'll, I'll see. But uh, for, for the time being, Colca Canyon is in there. And it's interesting also culturally. About 250,000 people visit Colca Canyon yearly. I think it was even up to 300,000 one year. So there's a lot of potential actually for condor watching when we start doing that in Lima. Uh, we continue uh, inland and up, up, up to the Altiplano and we get up to 4,000 meters only and we come up to the what has been called the highest navigable lake in the world. Uh, it does, I think that's a bit of an overstatement because if there's water you can navigate but here, there used to be actually line traffic between Puno town and Bolivia. So you could actually take, um, there was like steam boats uh, going over. They have a service now also that does that. But what uh, Titicaca perhaps is most famous for are these floating islands uh, that become sort of a tourist attraction. Uh, you go out and see the Urus, how they lived uh, rather than living because most of this is more, more like on display. But during the tourist season and the sort of the sunny season, uh, when, when it's not raining, uh, there will be people here pretty much uh, the, whole, the whole season. And they can even grow potatoes on these floating islands uh, if they want to do. Otherwise, they, they are fishing mostly and they fish for uh, the, same, the food items that this guy is eating, uh, name, namely the small Orestias fish. Until recently, I should say, and this. Um, Titicaca flightless grebe was uh, seriously threatened to extinction because uh, they, rather than fishing traditionally, they put out gill nets and fine nylon gill nets and, and the birds were caught in those as well. But now in later years, maybe quite a bit thanks to tourism, uh, the tourists, they don't want to eat this uh, crumb a little small fish, but uh, they rather have the rather bigger um, trouts. So uh, they started trout farming in the lake and uh, that has problems as well, of course. It's over a lot of nutrients that sort of sip into the lake. But it also means that no one is allowed to put their nets close by the, uh, the fish farms because the fish farm owners don't want to have any people sort of close to their nets. Uh, so meanwhile, these uh, Titicaca grapes can fish there without any problems. And they have actually recovered in recent years. So uh, we continue then uh, overland to Cusco, as I said. Uh, this is an overview of Cusco on the top photograph there, the Plaza Mayor, Plaza de Armas. And uh, it's built on top of the Inca city. And uh, so all the Inca, a lot of the Inca walls of the palaces are still in place. And then there are colonial balconies that you can see uh, here around and a, a lot of these cathedrals also also based on old Incan temples the grounds and then sort of top this uh, cathedral here is the um, Compania of the Jesuits and this is the cathedral itself all right uh, Cusco is the very famous Saxawaman site which was uh, thought to be a sort of a fortress well it was uh, functioning as a fortress when the um, Spaniards were, um, well, actually, when the Incas had revolted against the Spaniards, uh, when the Spaniards had, had arrived to Cusco and they put in the puppet Inca, and the puppet Inca was uh, uh, his sister, all, always molested by Diego Almagro, and he got a little bit sick of it and uh, then said, I've had this. So he escaped and started a counter revolution against the uh, Spaniards. And eventually they managed to get up here to the fortress and they had a, had a um, battle against the Spaniards here. But the uh, Spaniards who had been doing a lot of um, throwing out the Moors from Spain just recently knew how to take, uh, <laughs> take fortifications quite well and managed to uh, um, overman the Incas, uh, which have had to flee down the valley and take the refuge furthest down in Ollanta Itambo. And eventually they fled further down the valley. And uh, when Hiram Bingham found Machu Picchu, he thought he had found the spot where 
Manco Inca, the, the last Inca where he had, uh, where he had uh, taken his refuge in the valley and started guerrilla warfare against the Spaniards uh, for about some 40 years after Cusco had been taken. Uh, however, it turns out that this city of uh, Machu Picchu was built, uh, was used and forgotten from about 14, they think it was built around 1430. By the time the, uh, the Spaniards arrived 100 years later, it, it had been totally abandoned and nobody really knows why. There's a lot of uh, stories, of course, and uh, you will hear more of those when you come and visit Machu Picchu, I'm sure. Anyway, so that is the highlight maybe of your uh, Peru tour. And uh, when you're in Machu Picchu, you can actually do some birding as well. You have the torrent ducks there in the streams nearby. And in the garden of the Machu Picchu Pueblo Hotel, you can find a, um, the cock of the rock, the Andean cock of the rock, which is also the national bird of Peru. We also do a, a special birding uh, excursion nearby to the Abra Malaga woodlands, which is a polylepis woodland where you have the uh, endangered uh, um, royal synclodes. Uh, you have some really fantastic uh, subtropical forests here also that you, uh, there are a lot of hummingbirds that you can see. And uh, recently they have also put up a hummingbird feeder uh, not too far away from Ollante Tambo that we visit also another sort of a uh, Andean little village with built on Inca, uh, Inca grounds and Inca ruins, uh, also very interesting to visit. And um, so there, there's a feeding uh, station for hummingbirds and for other seed eating birds. There are also some dry woodland and, and some uh, endemics in this area that we would check out. And finally, on this uh, 16 day tour, we will fly down to the Amazon and some of the key birds down there. We, there are just too many birds to show you. <laughs> you there's like over, uh, there was a guy recently that had in 24 hours, I think he had 400 and um, yeah, it was, it was close to 400 species of birds in just one 24 hour period. Pretty amazing. Uh, the Huatzin, of course, is one of the birds that you find down there. And you also find these beautiful macaws with the blue and yellow macaw, the scarlet macaw, and the red and green macaw. And uh, so that, that would be like the end of the 16-day tour. And um, now coming back to my condor project, this is up the Santo Alalia Canyon. And you can visit that from Lima. It's only like three hours up the valley. And uh, when you go up there, you can also see uh, the endemic uh, great Inca finch, the colorful bird up in, in this area. There are five Inca finch species in Peru. They're all uh, endemic to Peru. Well, one sort of goes in a little bit to um, Ecuador, but that's it. And uh, higher up the valley, you also see the endemic uh, white sheep Katinga. But the main thing um, well, even higher up, there are some even better birds. There are the diadine sandpiper plover. This is up at 4,700 meters, almost 16,000 feet. And also here is the uh, critically endangered white-bellied synclodes. So, uh, but, uh, so now with COVID hitting, I had three projects uh, in mind that I could uh, sort of develop when I heard about that the government was actually doing some COVID support, uh, providing uh, monetary funds uh, for free that we didn't have to give back um, and up to about $30,000 and uh, for different projects that has to do with tourism and especially sustainable tourism or new novel projects. And I had three projects in mind. And the only one I could really do was the Condor project because that was close to Lima. And we I managed to set this up in less than uh, less than a week and we presented the project and we actually won uh, and got that. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a video here. Uh, this is a film with my iPhone. <laughs> so this is uh, partly, partly this video is from the first time we went up there. There's a viewpoint where the condors come down and sleep uh, in the afternoon. And so we will see them from uh, above like this and uh, eventually they come almost at eye level. 
And this is great per se, but it's sort of limited in the time in, in the amount of people you can actually get up to the area. So the project that we are doing consists actually of three parts. And the major part for birders or bird photographers is that we will want to uh, start feeding the birds and we have started feeding them and we will build a hide with mirror glass. So you can be really, really up close uh, taking photographs of the and, and video of the condors at really close range while they're on the carcass and while they're flying into the carcass. So that will be very impressive. But at the same time, of course, the condors will be habituated to come to this particular spot. And that means that we will be able to see it actually from the road, which you probably can see. Yeah, you saw it a little bit down there on that uh, image. You can see the road down there. So from that road is actually where we will be uh, have uh, a little bit above the road is where we will have the uh, feeding station and we will be able to see the condors there at close range and we could take more people up there as well and this will be very beneficial for all the communities up there so we work together in close contact with the with the uh, community uh, of Huachupampa plus the municipality and we have a really good uh, uh, project going and a little bit of monopoly right now actually because they've closed their village they don't have any cases of covid there so we are the only ones that have, have actually access to the town to take people up and look at uh, the condors uh, which is uh, quite a treat uh, i must say so uh this we have been doing uh, in the weekends and we will continue doing that for a few more uh, months until it opens up a little bit more for for tourists the other project that uh, I've been running for several years is the uh, City Road uh, project. Again, this is very similar to Manu Road that I talked about in my other uh, talk uh, that you can find still on the uh, Space Coast Birding Festival um, on the website. I think if you're signed up for that, you can still find my talk there. And I talked about the Manu Road. So the habitat here on the City Road is almost the same. It's very, very similar. And um, the problem is that there is very little infrastructure. And the other problem until recently was that uh, the uh, people living in the uh, area did not have any, any idea that the uh, nature per se was interesting. I don't know if any of you have been to Ecuador, but if you've been to Ecuador, you probably heard of a place called Mindo. And Mindo is a couple of hours from, uh, from uh, Quito. And it used to be when I visited there in 1995, uh, it was uh, it was almost like Satipa Road. They were cutting down the forest and there were clearing areas. They put animals in there. They put a lot of cows and nobody saw any value in the forest per se. And then 10 years later, I, I went back and now it was like a multi-million dollar tourist attraction. Not only birding, of course, but also orchids and butterflies and they're rafting and there were hotel and guard uh, orchid gardens and butterfly gardens and there were feeders everywhere, hummingbird feeders. There were a guy that was feeding the anpitas and uh, it was just amazing. So I figured what could I do to convince the people of the Satipa Road that this is a good idea? Well, I can talk and talk to them and it would go in one ear and out the other. Well, a better idea is if I take them to Mindo so they can see with their own eyes what happened there and they can talk to the people speaking Spanish. And then uh, uh, that same year, a uh, American NGO called Rainforest Partnership started working in the area and they still work in the area, but with not with the original community that I worked with. So I've taken up that again now. And so I work with the community that I originally worked with and they have a building that is supposed to be a um, lodge, but it's just one room <laughs> with beds in it right now. So what we want to do is to set it up for birders, make it birder friendly, uh, where we can see hummingbirds and a lot of colorful tanagers like these uh, paradise tanager here in the bottom and the golden tanager and the yellow scarf tanager and the scarlet belly mountain tanager and make it really, really good for bird photographers while we're also putting in um, wall separations inside the building so we can start using it as a lodge. And the community is very much in favor of that. So we have a project up on my website. You should check it out on the blog. So if you try to put down the word Satipa Road and uh, Mana Road, because I call it the poor man's Mana Road, 
because it's much cheaper to go there. You don't need to fly. There is no expensive lodges. And uh, but we're doing a program that we have been running now for nine hundred ninety nine dollars for for five days. And so you can do that uh, that program uh, any time of year. Um, uh, I, I guess I will be running that at least uh, at least until uh, until August this year, just to promote the area. There are a lot of uh, special birds for the Satipa Road. Also, we have a newly described brush finch. It's the black spectacle brush finch that was uh, described in year two thousand, I believe. And there's also the uh, uh, described actually last year, the what used to be the Milpo Tapaculo. It has been known for about 40 years, and it was finally described last year as uh, Chalca Tapaculo. And then here's a wren that I found that is very similar to plain-tail wren, but it sounds like an Inca wren that you can find <laughs> you can find that on at Machu Picchu, actually. And finally, here is also a thorn bird in the Montaro Valley. So it's a really unique bird. And uh, this thorn bird doesn't have a name yet, and this wren doesn't have a name yet, but uh, we're working on it. So um, uh, finally, then a little bit about um, the offers uh, to uh, to offer to you guys. If you remember in my last talk, then I talked about the Seven Wonders birding concept, and I just wanted to run through that with you again, uh, just uh, because this is our the way that we sort of conduct. A birding tours around the world. So we have an idea that uh, nowadays there are uh, people that don't have a lot of time and they, uh, well, especially you know that case in the US because you have in, in compared with the, the Brits or the Europeans or another, <laughs> other, uh, even in Canada, you know, you have much less holidays. But even so, even people with, uh, with long holidays find themselves that they don't have the time to do long trips um, because if when they come back uh, after the holiday they will still they will have piles of work uh, waiting for them or uh, <laughs> or they will have some see someone else sitting in, in their chair so uh, they cannot take more than maybe take five days off and then they can go on a tour such as this one right so we want to do these five a short five to seven day tours with a lot of wow factor that you can reach from any place in the world. Um, and with one weekend, do the trip and then fly back the next weekend. We also include a lot of the World Heritage sites. So much a picture is one of them. Uh, there is also in the material that you um, that I sent to um, uh, uh, Ro Rochelle it is also a uh, description about our uh, Machu Picchu program that also is included uh, that has this five-day setup that you can do culture and and uh, birds at the same time. Uh, we want to include the spectacular birds, the key birds in the area, also bird families, iconic mammals. Uh, there should be great photography opportunities and also comfortable lodging. So the trip that uh, Laura and Matt was doing was actually one of these sort of five-day tours that. Uh, uh, you can you can um, join and the the nice thing about that and, and which Matt and Laura will tell you about you don't have to be a birder to be on that trip in fact we had one person on the trip who said I'm not a birder the whole trip and then was going whoa all the time when she was seeing new stuff in the scope so um, <laughs> you probably know her anyway so um, that about that so some special post COVID offers that I've been uh, sending out in my newsletter. So here's the thing. You know how if you have like $1,000 in the bank, uh, you are not getting a lot of interest on that. So I figured instead of having those $1,000 in the bank, why don't you put that down as a deposit on a trip that will run in 2022 to 2024? And especially those uh, these short tours that I'm doing. You can do the long tours as well. It doesn't have to be the seven wonders burning tours. But you pay a deposit of $1,000 now. And guess what? I'm going to pay you much higher interest on that than you get from the bank. You get 10% interest on a yearly uh, basis, and it's compounded daily. So in the end, if you say, say you do a trip in November 2024, your $1,000 would be worth $1,400. So that will be knocked off from your 
a guaranteed price which will be set now <laughs> so uh, when when you do the uh, sign up for the tour the price is set and uh, you pay me the thousand dollars and the way i was thinking is that if i get like 30 40 50 people doing that i can buy that boat start the whale watching trips down in um, in uh, south of nazca but it will also sort of help us uh, get going because we've had a really really tough time and the other thing which is kind of nice also is that we're going to have a bunch of trips already scheduled and so there will only be like one up to two people per uh, departure that can take this offer so you had to be the first one to actually sort of sign up for that particular trip and um, and uh, we're going to have a lot of trips that we're going to offer there's a lot of new trips also you have to check out the websites but there's a lot of new trips in plan uh, so we have trips also for uh, madagascar coming up there's a trip for uh, cuba coming up as well and uh, we're also arranging a mongolia trip etc and then you find all the other stuff also on the seven wonders birding website but what if you want to do a trip very soon have you got anything for Easter? Yes, in fact, I do have a special offer for Easter. So um, uh, Peru has just opened its borders again. There used to be a quarantine, no quarantine now. You can come to Peru. Well, actually there is quarantine if you don't do the test when you arrive, you, you do a antigen test. Before you fly, you do a PCR test and that has to be done. You have to have the results 72 hours before you fly. Uh, no, the other way around. It can't be older than 72 hours before your flight. And uh, so you usually get that overnight if you take that uh, in, in, uh, uh, at, at your home destination. And then you get on the flight. And when you get to Lima, uh, you can get a antigen test. And once you get the anti te uh, antigen test negative, you can enter Peru and you can go on a holiday. And uh, what about the COVID situation in Peru? Yeah, it's been problematic. Yes, yes, it has been problematic. But I should say this, being out birding and doing all, there's a lot of COVID um, policies in place everywhere. Everywhere you go, there are COVID policies. The problems are the Peruvians themselves that do not uh, follow the policies. But in most places, and especially here in Lima, you can see that people are very, very strict on the policies, right? So, uh, and also in the restaurants and the hotels, etc. And the rest of the time, of course, you're out in, in the nature. And with all the, and, and with this thing coming into Peru now, you can be pretty sure also that your uh, fellow participants don't have COVID when they arrive because they're all doing the antigen test. And we will also do the antigen test on all our, well, at least the staff that are going in the car. We can't obviously enforce that on everyone else that are uh, that we are meeting but all these policies are in place so it's fairly safe the only thing with this 13-day uh, trip though is that we they've just put in a a no move uh, for three days over Easter so Easter Thursday uh, Friday and Saturday you is supposed to be in one place but we sold that by being on the Manor Road on this trip so this trip contains both the Manor Road and the uh, northern uh, areas and it's very very good for hummingbirds and you will see the marvelous spatter tail in the north the um, the sword billed hummingbird in two different places up in the north you have the royal sun angel and you have the rufus crescent croquette both on the Mono road and also in the north so it's a great uh, great trip uh, to do if you have the time it starts on november uh, sorry march 28 and i'm sure you can get a, a fantastic offers right now if you buy your tickets to come to Lima before the 28th. And this is an okra fronted uh, ant pitta that is at the feeding uh, spot um, in the near Abra Patricia. You also have the long whisked owlet here in two different space uh, places. I talk more about that in my other talk. And uh, the rufous crested croquette again. Uh, oops. And then um, uh, of course, this last minute offer that I was mentioning also, the 9.99 per person. Well, not only is the city, the city per road, through the months of what's remaining of March and April, if you can find a cheap flight, uh, you can go anywhere in Peru for five days for $999 with a, guide, a guided tour. 
Now, if we stay at any lodges, there will be small surcharges for the lodges uh, on those places. But usually you have, you know, a decent hotel with all the COVID um, things put in. And um, we have a minimum of just uh, two people. If it's just one, there will be $400 surcharge. But I'm sure you can find someone to go with. And it includes transport, guiding, lodging, and the food. It does not include the flights, internal flights. So that's why it's a cheaper road is such a good thing. Uh, entrance fees and additional lodge surcharges are not included in this special last minute offer until the end of April. And uh, here's our, uh, yeah, you can see the map here coming in from Lima. So this is the central highway coming here. And maybe if you do the central highway, that would have been an interesting thing to do. Uh, apart from the Satipa Road, you can do them both back to back, actually. And there you have also the Junin Grebe, uh, the Junin Rail, and uh, one of the best birds of Peru, the Golden Back Mountain Tanager. Um, if you read uh, Noah Stricker's account when he was with me in, uh, in, uh, in central Peru, there's an interesting story there. If you want to hear some more gunner stories, if you haven't heard the story from Matt and Laura yet. So uh, there are some more stories there how we got both, uh, we had a dead engine and two flat tires <laughs> when we arrived to the spot for the, uh, for the Golden Back Mountain Tanager. So the, the people in the car, they were asking me, this was like 4.30 in the morning. So what are we gonna do now? Well, let's go birding. <laughs> so we, we went birding and we saw the Golden Back Mountain Tanager. Anyway, it's a good story. Uh, Noah tells it really nicely in his book, uh, Birding Without Borders, if you haven't read that. So thank you so much for that. Uh, that was all. If you, I, I would like to you to sign up for my newsletter, sevenwondersbirding.com is one site and colibriexpeditions.com is the other. So there's two different uh, newsletters. Colibri Expeditions uh, newsletter is more personal. I also share some of my, of my crazy stories and my crazy ideas there. And, uh, and apart from the birding, and on Seven Wonders Birding, it's more about the traditional uh, birding that we do on these shorter tours around the world. Uh, so there you go. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, please reach out. Uh, you got my WhatsApp number there at the bottom and my email address, colibriexp at gmail.com. Well, thank you very much for that, Gunner. Round of applause, everyone. Yay! All right, so let's get into some good Q&A. Um, and while you guys are all thinking of your questions and I'm checking out the chat, I thought uh, you've heard, many of you, um, who may th keep thinking, who is this amazing Matt and Laura that keeps getting referenced? Well, um, besides like a list of a thousand things I could say about them, we're lucky to have them as some of the longest term board members for us at the Space Coast Audubon, uh, along with their roles in probably 2,612 different conservation and nature related groups. Oh, sorry, it's 13 because you just joined another one. Um, but they had an opportunity to go with Gunner on this amazing trip. So I thought I'd first chime, have them chime in and say, what did you find amazing and interesting and unexpected when you guys went to Peru? Matt and Laura? Oh, I think you're still muted on a device. Oh, I see you talking, but I don't yet hear you. Oh, your iPhone needs to be unmuted, I think is the thing. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, I don't see. Ah, darn. I don't see. You're not 5857, are you? No. No, not 58. Are you, are you 5857? Is that the last? It is. Okay, let's see if I can click to have send you an unmute request. Whoops. All right, are you guys there now? Yeah, can you hear us? Okay, now we hear you. Go right ahead. All right, let's hear what you thought was amazing and interesting. <laughs> All right, well, we, we knew the biodiversity was great, which is why I wanted to do Manu. And what was absolutely amazing is we went in five days. We went from the basically the Amazon, the wet down into the mud and the, the rivers up to 
whatever Machu Picchu is, 12,000 feet. And all along the way, the birds were different, more birds, different, more birds, different, more birds. So uh, that, that was the most amazing part to us. There's so much different. And what funny story would you like to tell about Gunner? <laughs> oh, I don't think we can go there. <laughs> oh, yes, we can. Oh, yes, we can. Yes, you can. Matt, oh. Matt is a storyteller, and there are lo- I, I've always heard a number of stories. Gunner was world famous to me long before this talk. So Matt, <laughs> as a storyteller, I'm sure would have something interesting to say. And anyone who didn't figure this out, who, uh, who happens to know our group, when he was talking about the person who's not a birder but is a birder, but says she's not a birder, and that's Angie, and we, she's moved Angie. up to Tennessee, but um, Angie is who he's referring to. But Matt, did that give you enough time to think of a funny gunner story? Oh, I need two seconds for that. So, <laughs> so I told Laura I didn't want to go to the Amazon. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm in this freaking Amazon. <laughs> I go, what is it? What are we doing here, right? And we're outside in the dark, and Angie oh, wants geez. to go frogging, of all things, all right? There are things that want to eat us out there, okay? And so we're frogging, we're having a good time, and all of a sudden, Gunner gets bitten. He gets bitten so hard, he starts screaming, and it was a bullet ant that had actually gone up his leg. And while I thought that was rather funny, all of a sudden I thought, my God, we're next. <laughs> and so we said, well, I think there's no more frogging tonight. Frogging done. You know, the, the, the one thing that I want to stress to everyone, though, is that this was our sixth trip to Central or South America. And what made Gunners different was that Gunner is the owner of the company. All of the T's were crossed. The I's were dotted. We went impossible places that no one else, there, no one knows the birders there where we went. We picked up species that no one else was getting. And the thing that was so cool is that when he did Machu Picchu with us, he had us walk down and by <laughs> walk, and he, he and Nigel walked up and they knew where all the birds were. It was absolutely incredible. So anyhow, back to Laura. <laughs> so yeah, we, Angie especially wanted to see Machu Picchu. So that was culture, but we also had birds in the very same day. So truly awesome. Oh, thank you so much for that. And you know, it's kind of like that. You don't have to run fast. You just have to run uh, faster than the person behind you when it comes to bears and stuff. So you don't yeah. have to get bit by things as long as your field guide is get bit first because they're dealing with the bites and you still have time. Exactly. To bite. <laughs> that all works out. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, while I'm looking for questions, Douglas, I know you've taken a trip to Peru. We were chatting about it during social hour. Did you want to add anything about your thoughts of Peru or anything fun story about Gunner as well? Well, the main thing I was really jealous of that Royal Synclonus gunner. Yeah. <laughs> the few birds we missed when I've been in Peru. Yeah. I've been to Peru several times. Uh, gunner uh, recommended Jean Paul to me to do several trips uh, directly out of Lima. I used to travel for business in Lima. Yeah. And ah. so we would do these half day trips. And I would recommend the Lomas de Lache, which. I mean, you can't mention everything in Peru, but yeah, that, I didn't, the I, other thing I would, I love the cactus canistero. It's my, my favorite bird in Peru. I know that's strange, but can't help it. Yeah. So we have in Lima, we have this also uh, like an oasis north of uh, Lima. And it's, uh, it's called, the habitat is actually called Lomas habitat. And it's the, uh, it's green the wrong time of year. It's green actually in what is in most of Peru is the dry season and it's dry also on the coast in terms that it doesn't really rain, but there's a lot of humidity because the, the gold, um, the um, Humboldt current uh, is, uh, is very cold. So you have these fog banks and they lie over the hills and you get this fog vegetation. And uh, it's only in some areas, some pockets where you get this vegetation. And this is a place where, where Douglas is saying, where you can see the cactus canistera. I actually took that out from the, <laughs> I had that original in the talk, but uh, I, I just, I tried to fit in too much anyway. I, was I, just, I wasn't uh, complaining. I know you, Peru has got 
great thing. I'm glad you mentioned the Inca Finch, though. Uh, I loved every single. You could have mentioned the crescent chests too. You know, you what are you going? <laughs> yeah, I did that on the other talk, so you can check that out. And and because in the other talk, I I talked about the unique bird families one can see in Peru. That's something that a lot of people are getting keen on. They realize that they can't see all the uh, birds in the world, so. Uh, well, maybe I could see all the bird families, you know, it's much more doable. Mm -hmm. There's a guy that has this nice website where you can actually sort of uh, tick off your uh, bird families and it's called uh, birdfamiliesoftheworld.com, I think. Birdfamiliesoftheworld.com is an Israeli guy and it's uh, quite nice. And one of the things that he puts there in the beginning is that um, there are 10,700 species of birds in the world. This is the bird, the bird families of the world, the abstract. That's pretty smart. <laughs> uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, I think it's the, uh, what is it, like 200 and is it 240 uh, families or so. Yeah, 260 maybe, 260 families. So, uh, wow. I should also mention, Gunnar, one of the things that we did down around Paracas was go looking for slender billed finch which yeah. I found for Jean-Paul, which oh, he really? was so happy. Oh, really? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, actually, in the Nazca site, once we get that sorted, Nazca is brilliant for Slenderbill finch, a very nice bird there. So, uh, And uh, eventually, there will be also flights to Nazca. And uh, when there are flights to Nazca, I, that area is going to boom. And it's kind of cool. So now, uh, we, I've been going out with fishing boats there, but they are extremely slow from this uh, port called Punta Lomas. Yeah, very slow. I was there two weeks ago. And um, so getting our own speed boat there and just go out a little bit, we would see loads of uh, interesting stuff. And we don't have to go out for, for a, a long pelagic trips, maybe two, three hours will be enough, you know, to see the birds there. And once they get the airport, that area is going to boom, you know, because uh, when you when you say Peru, I think there's like for non-birders, there's like three things that come, well, four things that come to mind. It's Machu Picchu, it's Inca, it's Titicaca, and it's Nazca. And maybe now on the fifth place is the food, right? But but those are those are the things, you know. But a lot of people when they realize that, oh. Um, I have to go 500 kilometers south of Lima to go to Nazca. Oh, no, that's just too long. If they only go for a week, the first thing they skip is the Nazca lines. So, because you can't fly there. Right? So. Speaking of food, my favorite food in, in all of Peru was the Pucasana ruins in Lima. Uh huh. Oh, yeah, that's it. They have a nice, uh, oh, you mean the, uh, no, Puc Pucliana, Pucliana. That's correct. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there's a ruin there in Miraflores, not too far away from where I'm at, actually. Oh, fantastic. Well, Robert has made a comment that I thought was wonderful. Of course, he said, excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, and he said that he works uh, at the National Aviary in Pittsburgh. And among the very the things that are very popular with the, res the, the very popular residents there, sorry, at the National Aviary are the Inca Terns. Andean condors and the Andean cock of the rocks. Um, and he, they are actively involved in captive breeding program for condors and work collaboratively with the zoo in Ecuador. Um, by a parque, I'm not going to say that correct. Our, our, our Ama Ru, right? Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so Robert, thanks for adding that comment. Uh, I saw that very much. Uh, so that is better interesting. Um, you got an Inca, you got an Inca turn in in the states right now. Did you know? It's a bit far away from. Uh, no, where's that at? Why was it? Oh, I don't have the. Hawaii. <laughs> oh, Hawaii. All right, oh, I got friends there. I'm, I'm willing to go. There now, you know, so you just uh, you just have to go to Hawaii to see the Inca turn. So some people I'm up for that. There. <laughs> some people said on the rare bird thread, you know, in the yes. US rare bird thread, and they were saying. Um, it's actually cheaper flying to Peru than to Hawaii. <laughs> oh my gosh. And yeah, I don't doubt that in, one, one yeah, bit. Yeah, especially <laughs> you guys in Florida right now. I think, I, I think from, from Miami, I don't know from Orlando, but it's probably similar from there as well. But uh, from uh, Miami, it's like $300 return. You know, it's like- Wow. Yeah. So uh, uh, 
charter flights are good. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so I have a question for you, Gunnar. I thought of this when you and I were doing our practice sessions for this. When you were talking about the condors on the little platform where everyone's going to come to see them, and you were saying about putting the carcasses out, where do those carcasses come from? Uh, usually uh, they are old donkeys or, or they have lots of goats in the area. So they still use a lot of donkeys and goats. Now that, that is a good question though, because we, we, there was a carcass of a donkey put out, you know, so there's one, when, when the donkeys sort of have, have led their, <laughs> their active life and they're not very useful anymore for the farmer, um, nobody wants to eat donkeys. So that's a, a good way of getting a bunch of meat at the same time. So they usually put them down because they don't have any they don't have any reason for having them. They just create problems when they can't, when they get too stubborn and, <laughs> and they want to move, basically. So, um, uh, and of course, uh, the uh, condors need need to eat food. So sometimes uh, eat, eat, uh, eat carcasses and uh, sometimes these donkeys are just sort of pushed over the the uh, the edge. But, but this is a much better way of, uh, of uh, actually feeding the condors straight away. But there's a... Um, we need to find a, a food source and we have what we are sort, trying to sort out is to try to get uh, intestines, et, et, et cetera, from slaughterhouses. And uh, so we're working on that sure. right now we, uh, because the last time we had this uh, donkey out, we couldn't predict when the condors were going to come down. So we came there like two days afterwards uh, and, and hadn't touched it. Then we came like six days afterwards and they'd eaten a little bit, but most of the donkey was still there. And uh, there was no uh, condors on the carcass at, at, at all when we arrived, which we would have expected. And then we came 10, year, uh, 10 days later and then it was almost gone. So <laughs> sometime in between there, uh, they had uh, eaten a lot. And a donkey is probably a little bit too much food at one time. So the idea is that if we can do that rarely and then put out more frequently and especially when we get photographers put out the uh, intestines uh, and uh, tripes and, and things and the condors will be habituated to eating that that's the idea but it will take some time it won't go overnight but eventually it shall work Wow, rather interesting. So my thought would be you don't want to be downwind for the 10 days before they eat it all. <laughs> so it had to be a little ripe. Or if, you know, if you're not quite sure where the platform is, nose is in the air, and there you go. You can find it, no problem, even if the vegetation is thick. So <laughs> yeah. no, no, it's pretty neat because the platform is like 80 meters above the road. So it means ah. that uh, they, the condors will feel safe from there uh, when they come down and sit there. And uh, we have had them sitting at the side of the road. So it's not like they shun away from the road by any means. So uh, once they sort of feel safe and they will feel safe above, and they will also get accustomed to have, having people below them because they get accustomed with that at Colca Canyon. So, um, and it should be no problem whatsoever of actually seeing them from the road. And once you start seeing them from the road, then tourism can grow to, to such a, a large number that it will have an impact on the local economies. But it, with just pe taking people up to the viewpoint, you can't fit more than 20 people from that spot where, where I was filming with my, uh, with my cell phone. So we, we need this uh, condor feeding place in order to have them for sure at one spot where people can see them from the road. So. Well, uh, I think with $300 round trip ticket, you might, someone might want to come up and take you up on that condor offer and just think probably it's one person on that platform right now while everyone's yeah, still yeah, getting adjusted right. to it. Uh, uh, and I know yeah. there's a few people, at least two that I know that are on this call today that have had both of their jabs. So they're good to go. And yeah. so, <laughs> uh, all right, well, I'm going to look for some more questions. Looks like we have a couple more comments. Let me just, most of it's excellent 
presentation. Thanks so much. While I'm doing that, while anyone's thinking of any other questions, I wanted to make two more quick announcements. Um, Connor, sorry, I keep saying Connor because it's Condor and Gunner. Gunner mentioned a couple of handouts. Um, so I'm going to be, those will be uploaded into Meetup because most everyone registered for Meetup. There's a couple of the guests that came through that were not in Meetup. If you want to just send me an email, I put it in chat. It's info at spacecoastaudubon.org and I can send you the documents directly or the links to, to the meetup to get those documents that Gunnar referenced. And I got so excited in all the announcements and so excited for Gunnar to come on that I forgot to mention the butterfly walk. Um, so there's a butterfly identification course and a walk around the Turkey Creek Sanctuary. Um, this is not being sponsored by the Space Coast Audubon, but we are supporting it because one of our board members is leading at Kate Wells. Um, um, so it's $20, and, and the money goes to the Friends of the Turkey Creek Sanctuary. So you'll see that in chat. It's a two-day event, so you go on the 21st and the 28th um, and do the identification. And also, for those of you who are here locally, um, it's most likely, with the things that are in bloom, what's going on out there right now, that you can probably get at least 10 individual species, which means that you would get your Level 1 Wings Over Florida certificate. So in one trip, just taking that class, you could already probably earn your level one certificate. So that's the butterfly updates. Let me just check to see, um, does anyone else have a question? Um, oh, Doug has another question. You want to read that out, Doug? I think that's an interesting question everyone will want to hear. Oh, you're still on mute, Doug. Or I can... Read it out if you can't unmute. Give him another second. There, Why don't we, I... go. there okay, we go. Okay, there you go. All right. Uh, yeah, Gunnar, one of the things that uh, we saw uh, at, around Paracas was also we ran into a whole flock of Peruvian tern, and uh, John Paul was thrilled. And he yeah, told yeah. Me it's a very rare, at least then, that was a very rare bird. And I was just wondering if they're doing any better. Yeah, it's very hard to uh, know really about that bird because one of the sites where we used to see it is north of Lima at a place called uh, Paraiso, Paradise. It's a beach area there. But the last couple of times when I've been going there, I haven't seen it. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, so that that's quite sad. I actually went now in November with a client who was very keen on seeing it. And, and we've had breeding before in November there. Uh, not many, but uh, still. So, uh, and most I mean, last couple of years, I don't, I haven't had it there at that site. So that's that's worrying. However, there are a few sites in the north where we see it quite regularly, close to Pura, and Paracas is still a stronghold. And the other thing that happens also, every once in so often, when we go out to sea, you actually find the Peruvian terms far out you know, on the plage. They could be like 20 to 30 miles out. Really? Yeah, it's wow. uh, astonishing. So that's, that's a little turn. Yeah, but the problem for, as it is for most of those sort of small, least and uh, lesser and all the snowy turns or all what, what they're called, the, the fairy turns in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the problem with all of them is that they nest on beaches that are very, often very popular also by humans, beachgoers. And in Peru, we don't, we have very few beaches that are actually 100% protected. And now with all these, I don't know what they call in English, they call them cuatro motos, four wheel motor. ATVs. Yeah. <laughs> ATVs. All, -terrain, all terrain vehicles is what we call them, yes. <laughs> all right, ATV, I just learned a new word, word. okay. Yeah, so with all those people going on the beaches like crazy and uh, they also take the four wheel drives, etc. So it is a problem um, since we have very few protected beaches in, in Peru. And uh, so Paracas is probably one of, them, one of the areas, so areas where you can't really get to with the four wheel drives are, are the best ones, I guess. And uh, yeah, wow. so it, yeah, it's bad. Douglas, thank you very much for that. Um, so my question, since I'm curious about this bird now, how many centimeters when you say little, like a sanderling or smaller than that or? 
Okay, so you yeah, know least, you know least turn. It's basically uh -huh. a least turn. Same same size, same. Ah. So it's very closely related to least turn. Least turn has the same sort of problems, but it's wider spread. So, uh, um, uh, but um, it's darker underneath, and uh, yeah, and it's much more dainty. Yeah, yeah, you reckon? It's a very okay. dainty bird. Yeah, it's a very small. Yeah. Well, I, I was saying when we were doing bird or chat that I just found one of my old field guides, um, which is interesting because when I went to Peru, I wasn't a birder, but I bought all kinds of books on nature. So I'm going to have to go look it up in my old guide. So um, I don't see anything else in the chat. So um, I, I'm looking around the screen for everyone who has video on. I don't see anyone else's hands raised. So from that perspective, I just wanted to say again, a huge thank you. Uh, we enjoy seeing you at the festival. We, we um, appreciate you taking your time for, to be with us this evening. Um, and we hope that you'll see some of us in person there now that you're one of the earliest countries to open up with no quarantine. Uh, so, so thank you so much for all the wonderful information and the Condor Project update, which is what it's always great to have good news that comes from COVID. And that was a direct good news because of COVID type thing that that was able to be put in place. And we were able to see some of the first outcomes of that here live at the Space Coast. Um, so I also want to thank all the guests who joined us this evening. So um, a couple of you are still on, um, Mariette and Douglas, and I think Michael and Robert had to leave. I'm looking around, but thank you for joining us. And should you ever make your way back to Florida, for those of you outside of Florida, we will welcome you with open arms and love to take you around the refuge from other places. So we hope that you'll take us up on that. And Gunnar, if I don't see you before, I'll see you next January uh, at the uh, 2022 Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival. And for anyone else who, um, when he was mentioning about this year's festival, it was virtual and all of the recordings for the, the festival will be available and active until July. And there's a, the festival itself charges a $59 registration fee to get access to the recordings. Um, it does not include, there's another level if you want workshops and photography and all that, but for the basic level, um, that's available until July and included in that level is Gunner's Talk. So the other one he kept referencing, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, please register for the festival if you can and have an opportunity to listen to his talk amongst all the other wonderful speakers that presented at the virtual festival this year. And on that note, I just, on behalf of the entire Space Coast Audubon board, thank you all for joining us this thank evening. You, thank, you, thank you so much for having me. I want to know if any Floridian will take me to Mahogany Hammock. Mahogany Hammock? Where's that? I don't even know. Oh, the Everglades. Yeah. There's a, there's a oh. there's barrel there. Oh, well, you know what? I know a good airboat guy down there. I'll take you, Douglas. Oh, you right. I know I a private witnessed. airboat guy down there that I did. With the, I, did I went to the Everglades with, uh, he, and he just takes private people all the way back. So you show up in Florida, I'll be happy to take you. Yeah, it's a species <laughs> of, of seaside sparrow, but it's, it used to be a full species. Oh. So I can count it. <laughs> well, there you go. But I feel like it, but I feel like it. <laughs> Well, we need to do that on Global Big Day, because just think of that. We'd have a, something special to tell the world. So, Gunnar, thank you very much again for um, your presentation. Hands up, everyone. Big claps. Big claps. Yay. Um, I wish you all happy trails. Hope to see you at one of our um, um, field trips, if you were lucky enough to make the short list. Uh, if not, we'll see you next month when we're off to Panama for yet another adventure. So good night, good, good evening, and have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the outdoors and see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.